Good afternoon and welcome everyone back to the Strategic Nexus uh, series of panels. Uh, I am Dr. Ori Sella, the chair of the Department of East Asian Studies at Tel Aviv University. And uh, I'm chairing the session called Between Connectivity and Security, the New Role of Technology in china Euromed Relations. A very tricky issue, a very thorny issue for some, and uh, I'm hoping for a fascinating panel. Um, in our panel, allow me to uh, introduce the, the speakers. In our panel, we'll have a keynote speech by Professor Gadi Aliyev, um, who's a retired associate professor of technology and information systems management at the Kohler School of Management at Tel Aviv University and a dear friend and colleague of mine. Following our keynote speech, which will start in a second, uh, we will have a discussion by each of the following very uh, distinguished and interesting uh, persons. The first will be Minister Lucio De Michele, the head of policy planning at the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Then we will have Mr. Hu Kun, the president of ZTE Western Europe and CEO of ZTE Italy. Then Mr. Luigi De Vecchis, president of Huawei Italia. Mr. Ilan Maor, managing partner at Sheng Enterprises, Shanghai, and president of the Israel-China Chamber of Commerce, and uh, also Professor Franco Lapenta, the director of the Institute for, of Future and Innovation Studies at the John Cabot University in Rome, and Prof Professor Luigi Martino, professor of cybersecurity and international relations in the University of Florence. So we begin by the keynote speech by Professor Gadi Ariav. Gadi, the floor is yours, and so is the screen. I'm sharing the screen. Uh, and I will, okay, just a second. Uh, whoops, sorry. In a minute. Okay, so um, <clears throat> good evening, afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Ori, for the invitation, Enrico uh, Faldella uh, for setting up this uh, conversation, and uh, and the dear uh, indefatigable Martina in the back uh, to to keep us all going. The um, I, when I was asked to, to make a few comments, I sort of took the, uh, the, the task with uh, some sort of hesitation because, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with technology for a long time uh, and I've been dealing with China uh, or following China, contemporary China, uh, from a business perspective for a long time. Uh, and the combination, and Middle East, I, I live in the Middle East and follow Israel in particular, less so the, uh, the scene elsewhere but uh, so I, I delved into the uh, sort of what do we what can we say about the uh, the topic the, the sort of title of the uh, our discussion uh, the connectivity and security as an issue I mean there's no doubt I mean everybody's concerned about it the uh, and uh, so it's really obvious point a uh, mute point I would say to anyone in the business world as well as the uh, sort of international business uh, community, the uh, political science, politicians, uh, and, and so on. So dealing with that is, is sort of obvious. The, uh, the subtitle of the, uh, the session was the new role of technology in China, uh, Europe, uh, Europe Mediterranean Nexus. Here I put three question marks. And I guess, I mean, true to my Israeli uh, sort of nature that I'm showing my Israeli bones here, uh, I would like to challenge the, uh, the assumption, okay? Um, and I'm giving you the uh, sort of the bottom line of my uh, sort of opening comments and issue to discuss is that I, in my analysis, don't see any story, any Euro-Mediterranean uh, Chinese story in the realm of uh, connectivity and security. I mean, the story is much larger. Uh, if, and in, in, if 
at anything or any any uh, sort of other consequence, it uh, it falls into the um, sort of the the um, the struggle, if you will, the competition rivalry, if you will, between China and and the U.S. And I don't think there's a, as I said, uh, there's a particular game played uh, between uh, China and the uh, uh, European Mediterranean. And you know, the uh, uh, we're in the science community are putting up hypotheses to be uh, refuted. So I'll be listening carefully to your comments. If you disagree, I think I'll make a lively panel and what else do we need? Having listened carefully to the, uh, to the presentations before, I mean, I think, uh, and I'm referring to the age of exploration, there's no doubt that the uh, Euro Mediterranean, they can, let me call it UMED for not losing my tongue, uh, the centrality of UMED geography in, in sort of historically and yesterday it came up very clearly in the, uh, in the analysis of trade. I mean, this is a, an obvious point, okay? So that said, you know, I listened also carefully to the issue of the discussion of FinTech and, uh, and UMED mm -hmm. and, I, and I think they, they conclude, my conclusion was very similar to the one I have with respect to technology in general. Uh, which is, you know, these are interesting issues, but they, you know, if you look at in, in the sense of affinity, sort of, it is, it's a technology story, it's a technology policy story, not necessarily a EU, EU med story. So that's basically the, the, the upshot of what I want to say. And let me briefly go through the, the, um, the detailed points. And I suggested that, you know, the, uh, to structure our conversation in order to get some closure around the four sort of uh, uh, detailed uh, observations, if you will, okay? And, you know, recognizing that, you know, we're talking about balancing connectivity, national security, and economic security, there's sort of three types of what I call vectors that uh, uh, poor policymakers have to, uh, to struggle with and balance and, and I say poor, not just in a cynical way, it is uh, probably a dilemma, Nam namely there's no uh, analytic solution to that. And so different opinions might, might apply. So again, the bottom line uh, that I will uh, explore in the following few slides is the uh, stepping one step back and look at the ICT information communication technology deployment dilemma and that's and that's true in, in any application, okay? I mostly deal with uh, enterprises, multinational enterprises, local enterprises and so on. And you have the issue of safety, security, privacy, functionality and cost, and they don't move, on, the vectors are not moving in the same direction, okay? I mean, the, the, the easiest way to, uh, to relate to that is that those of you who work, for example, and look at functionality and, and security, okay? Uh, some of us work in organizations that have erected walls uh, like the uh, VPN, uh, private networks and so on. And uh, in order to get easily to your email, you have to sort of look at your, your I mean, look at your uh, mobile phone to get a, a, a password, pa type it in if you make no mistakes eventually. So there's a security layer around that and so on. Obviously much less convenient than, you know, logging in or going directly into your email and so on. I use it as a metaphor because that applies to the entire sphere of consideration and it makes it uh, somewhat more vivid. So I'll spend a you know, few slides about the, um, uh, the, the fundamentals of the, of the dilemma, okay? And then, you know, looking at, uh, you know, mostly the issue of cost and economics, I will sort of try to look at the world and see, can we avoid or can you know, uh, the, the uh, fractured uh, situation globally that allows, uh, you, know, uh, you know, where we exploit different resources all over the world for economic sake, and then sacrifice some of the security. That is sort of an issue that uh, international business uh, strategy is dealing with it in different contexts. I'll explore that. The uh, set observation, and uh, again, you will sort of uh, are more than invited to sort of, uh, you know, 
refute my, my observation, although it's, uh, I think it's fairly backed by, by data, uh, that the European uh, uh, tech sector is relatively weak between the two, uh, the American one and the Chinese one, and I'll have some data to uh, relate to that. And so moving closer to the, to the title and the focus of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, the conference, we'll, I'll sort of look at the UMED uh, innovation cluster. The, uh, and I'll spend the word about what is innovation cluster because that's how we think about strategy. It is relatively weak and with the, with the exception of Israel. And actually, if you include Israel in the UMED, and it is included in the UMED, in, not only in terms of, you know, Ori's presentation and the Tel Aviv University uh, presence in that, uh, but, you know, in, in other means, uh, that is sort of saving the face of UMED in, in many ways. And finally, go back to the map and look at the, uh, the significance of non present uh, EU or European, what I call continental Europe, and I'll make a comment about that later uh, in the um, sort of tech game. And we go back to the, uh, to the opening session and the, you know, the session that follows on, on day one, uh, where pretty much the story was, was not a European story. It was actually a, um, you know, the fight between um, US and China on supremacy. And, the, and, and technology has become a major component of that competition uh, for, and, and with, the, with interesting consequences for China and, and, and others, by the way. Okay, so that's the game plan. And I told you what I would like to tell you. Let me tell you in more details. Okay, so if we look at the fundamentals uh, of information technology, it's fundamentally unsafe. I mean, you have to be very naive to assume that every time that your computer is, is malfunctioning, uh, there's a sort of superpower uh, lurking in, in your uh, computer and sort of trying to steal your data and, and destroy your work, okay? That's not the case. The, the complexity of the, of the technical systems is unmanageable by all means. And, and again, I mean, if, they, if we were had more than 10 minutes, we would go into, into the numbers. We're talking about even the smallest numbers, okay, uh, are, you know, include hundreds of thousands of commands. And there's so many bugs, as we call them, or mistakes per sort of thousand of commands. There's no way that the, uh, the software and, and even hardware, actually, can be completed, uh, uh, considered safe. So it's unsafe, okay? That is sort of observation number one. Observation number two is that, you know, system that has to do with culture of engineering, and I wouldn't spend too much about that. It has been researched because, you know, the, uh, some of the flaws of the system is because engineers are optimistic and they look at what the systems can do. They not usually looking at the, uh, what systems cannot do or what the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the limitations of, of the system that comes typically as, a, as an afterthought or as a sort of very unpleasant discovery later on. And then comes the, uh, the economics of it. And that, uh, you know, brings us closer to the, uh, to the discussion today. And that is the, you know, the issues of time to market and winners takes all. And the, the nature of technology and technology development and technology innovation and so on is that there's a winners takes all is actually the, the natural economic consequence of the fact that you spend a lot of money on the first, you know, let me say it in, in a sort of funny way. Uh, the first version of an operating system costs a billion dollar and the second one costs a cent to send over. So that is very unusual from a point of a microeconomic analysis. And uh, so therefore there's a, a natural force to, uh, uh, to have a winner takes all. And, and you know, I'm not, I'm not making a, a sort of a judgment call. Uh, the Chinese companies have been winners in this space, okay? And we have with us uh, representatives of, of some of the uh, more uh, striking examples of, of a winner that if not takes all, takes a lot. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense economically to, uh, to use their equipment, their solutions, and so on. 
Uh, and that brings the economics. And when we're dealing with public policy, uh, you know, we take a, a, the sort of cost into consideration. The other thing is time to market. And again, a winner takes all or someone who's big enough to bring uh, solutions to the market faster than anyone else is, is in a position to, uh, to gain a market share. Okay. And finally, the point, uh, and it has to be said intellectually, to be intellectually honest, is that, you know, and that's perhaps one of the major concerns that may show up in our conversation is that, you know, honestly, my spyware is an asset and your spyware uh, or threat is criminal, is a threat or criminal tool. Okay. Uh, probably, you know, it'll be very innocent to, to assume that governments do not spy on each other. I mean, there's certain etiquette that comes with that, uh, but, uh, you know, we basically have to realize that we live in a world uh, quite open to anyone who spends enough uh, to, to see what's going on elsewhere, if they have the interest and so on. I'll elaborate a, li a little bit about that, but then these are the fundamentals. Let me jump into the, um, to the issue of uh, what are we trying to do? So if we're trying to develop a national ICT security strategy, and I remind everyone, we're talking about security and connectivity, okay? And at this point, I'll talk more about uh, security. Connectivity will come uh, in the next uh, two slides or so. Uh, it has to do with the issue of risk. And one thing which is missing, and I can sort of having read the, the, the conversation and so on, uh, there is risk estimates tend to be emotional and uh, folksy rather than rational and uh, sort of, uh, you know, well argued. So I call for, uh, for, for that and that, that's needed to be done, you know, and uh, I mentioned crime. The, um, if we take the criminal framework, then we combine three, we have to sort of look at three things motivation to, to commit it, the, the presence of opportunity and the, uh, you know, the impediments, if you will, or the, uh, uh, the guarding the, uh, the, the assets that are significant, okay? So what are the losses? The losses are, and again, I'm in a way taking the, uh, the, the business perspective, but that applies uh, very clearly to, um, by analogy to, uh, to the state perspective and all, all my esteemed colleagues to the, to the panel I guess represent a, a sort of a macro view. So there's obviously economic and financial losses and we've seen some cyber attacks that were sort of politically motivated and created the economic impact. Uh, you know, in Israel where there's a sort of a notion uh, that says, you know, according to foreign sources, uh, because sometimes the, um, it, you're not allowed to, uh, to, to say what you know, but uh, so according to uh, foreign sources, uh, we Israel has created some damage, economic damage on some uh, some other forces if, that they want reputational, regulatory, regu uh, legal consequences, and what has become very prominent after the election in the U.S. is the political disruption and intervention. Okay, so one comment that again puts us in the European context is that you know the the two issues of security and privacy is not the same. Okay, security is more a state concern. Privacy is the individual concern. As things turn, turn out, Europe has decided to focus on the privacy. Your contribution to the, uh, to the discussion, I mean, in general uh, terms, has been the GDPR. The GDPR has created a lot of uh, sort of, uh, I guess, shock waves. Uh, although the enforcement uh, of the GDPR has to uh, uh, has to be dealt with, but uh, but the discussion has been completely on privacy, okay, less so on security, and that's interesting uh, to note in term, in this particular space, okay. So how do you um, sort of devise the uh, you know the uh, the protection of your digital assets? And I I pose here a question, qu more question mark than than answers, because as I said in the opening comment, uh, it's very difficult to find uh, the uh, sort of the uh, perfect analytic solution. 
okay? But basically is how you balance convenience and control, okay? Uh, you like to allow people to buy, you know, their online in the least expensive and, and least inconvenient way, then you would allow Alibaba to operate freely. And obviously Alibaba has all the data, uh, but then the data resides in China for all you know, practical purposes uh, and you lose control over that, okay? And then the question, the secondary sort of corollary is how much to tolerate, how much risk to tolerate and how much you're willing to spend to, depend, to defend against it, okay? In the public policy frame, there's a lot of discussion in, uh, in Europe recently about the, the notion of technology sovereignty, okay? And technology sovereignty is basically taking these two principles in technology application, which, as I said, I've been dealing with in the last 50 years, uh, to the state level. And basically, if you want to have perfect sovereignty, that means that businesses are confined, businesses, enterprises, organizations are confined completely to the territory that you control legally or regulatorily and, and, and so on. But then comes economics because you can, I mean, placing the, the cloud in your territory uh, may be too more costly than putting it in the uh, Arctic uh, because uh, it's so expensive to cool uh, data centers, okay? Do you allow your data to reside in the sort of uh, in, in the Arctic zone uh, in order to make it less expensive than sort of bearing in, in your own mountain? So these are the very practical dilemmas. Technology sovereignty recognized by the um, uh, officers of the European Union in a very clear way. And the, obviously there's an issue here, okay? And maybe a selective question. So the question is how far to push it? Okay, and if you push it, then you, the, the immediate consequence is digital fragmentation. And if you do it by, instead of, uh, let's say, EU perspective, and let's assume that the uh, UMED uh, has decided to form a, a coalition uh, separate from the rest of the EU, then it means that everyone who wants to buy a, a German product who, and they are not part of the, the UMED will find it more difficult to reach data and will have to pass through, or someone will have to do the bridges and so on in terms of technology. That is sort of the dilemma. And the question is how you articulate corresponding protection strategy, okay? And that moves us to the uh, to international business strategy, okay? And I'm sort of borrowing that from my lectures on, uh, on uh, international business strategy because the invisible hand of globality, and I'm speaking about globality because that's the condition we are. Globalization is a process. The process has been going for 20 some, almost 30 years now. Globality is a condition. Your customers, your clients, your suppliers, your competitors can come from everywhere, okay? So when a um, international business strategy is looking or international strategy is looking at the wall of ICT, basically the picture they see is the one you see below. And it's a picture that I keep showing in order to get feedback to that. And uh, so that's been maintained in a, in a very uh, sort of, a, a sort of permanent way over the years. One thing which is clear here, and I'll, I'll come back before my final comments is that uh, continental Europe is not on the map, okay? What you see here, the bubbles are the uh, clusters, uh, clusters of uh, uh, technology innovation. And I'll explain what a cluster means in a second. There's sort of broadly speaking, two major, I'm sorry, three pillars in, on the map. One is US, another one is China, another one is India. Israel is the anomaly. And in that sense, uh, you know, makes the European pictures somewhat uh, nicer. Japan is to the, uh, to the end, okay? It doesn't mean that there's no technology development elsewhere, but these are I the hubs. Yep. Forgive my interruption, but uh, you need to wrap up. I will wrap up, okay. So the, uh, when a company looks to that and says, okay, if that's the world where I put, where, what in the world I do, uh, I do what? There's one more slide that I need to uh, 
to, to stop on, okay, to pay some attention. And what I try to do, I put my headquarters in Silicon Valley because that's the smart money is, and I do design in Israel because there's an endowment of design there. And I do development by outsourcing in Bangalore. And I serve Japan from Dalian for historical purposes. Okay. So just to, um, what is in the node? Okay. Technology companies and investors, subcontractors, professional services, universities and government. Tech companies, investors, obvious. Subcontractors, so I don't have to, uh, to do everything myself. Uh, universities for IP and, and aid, uh, manpower, government to solve market failures, okay? What was missing in Europe, or what is missing is investors, okay? The liquidity necessary to fund it. The, the structure, and we can go on, and Ori is already signaling, uh, and he's sort of standing up, so I have to, he may come over to my home to, uh, to kick me out. Uh, the whole structure is actually lowers the risk of innovation entrepreneurship, okay? There's an interesting study that looks at the, at the, at the cluster, very old, we know, and, and we may come to that, the discussion, and uh, I will skip this one as well. This is Israel, and basically Israel is a one cluster, just to get the perspective. Another cluster that I've been spending time is the one, the Shanghai Nanjing cluster, and to, to put in perspective, that's, that's the cluster, okay? And by the way, the map is of the 300, almost 50 R&D, multinational R&D centers based in Israel. So the map that I've shown uh, before is actually actualized. I mean, companies behave this way, okay? And as I said, you know, if you're looking at the, uh, and I've chosen to, to look at the maturity and the, uh, Ori, this is the, the last slide that I will spend more time on, is um, I'm looking at unicorn. Unicorn, to those who are not familiar with the term, is the companies before they became public or exit, okay, private companies in the, in the startup stage that are valued about billion dollars, okay? And you can argue back and forth whether it's good measure. To me, it indicates strength and depth of the, of the cluster. So if you look at the, and there, I mean, according, you know, as of April, 2021, there are 692 valued at $2.2 trillion. And if you look at the 10 most biggest, uh, there's, you know, Europe is, is, is not there. There's a Klarna in, 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 in Sweden for, for a FinTech, uh, mostly US, two Chinese, one uh, Brazilian because of size and, and go to is a recently formed Indonesian, okay? I'm looking at, uh, you know, China unicorns and continental Europe unicorn, and, and you can see from the numbers, I mean, there, there's, there's no comparison, okay? China unicorns, and again, indicating the strength and depth of the innovation landscape, if you will, is 20% of the, uh, of the map with the value that actually exceeds it. Continental, and I put continental in parentheses because uh, it excludes the, the UK, but includes Israel and Ireland. So it's not entirely continental. Uh, it's about 5%. Within that, to bring the, the message home, uh, I looked at the sort of the UMAD unicorns and you know, relative to, to Europe, we're, it's not a bad, uh, not a bad uh, situation. 28 of the 36, okay? I actually, uh, the, the UMAD, and, but, but that's small. You can see that the relative value is there. If you look at the countries, Israel is about half of it, both in value and number, which is an interesting uh, phenomenon in and of itself, okay? Finally, you know, the, uh, looking at the world, uh, that's how Microsoft, and that's on record, Steve Ballmer, Ballmer at some point said, when I want to know what the world is doing in terms of technology, that's what I look for. And uh, so the question is, you know, and we have esteemed members of the, um, you know, of a Chinese company with us, why would company would look at, uh, at Europe in general? Probably for the market, not for real substantive collaboration. And, and further question, and again, I'm putting it as a question mark, uh, provocative perhaps in this context is, why would they look within Europe at Euromed, okay? Trade, we understood, FinTech, technology, and so on. And, you know, and I, and I quote here, the, um, 
And actually Francesca Bria, uh, the chair of INF, uh, coined it. I would not be as uh, vulgar and, uh, you know, brute uh, force uh, or, or sort of to, to say it. Um, and that's a quote. She said, Europe is a colony caught, technology colony caught between US and China. Okay. So that concludes my sort of introductory comments. And uh, I hope there'll be uh, blood on the stage. Ori, back to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Gadi, for a fascinating talk and uh, a provocative one as well. Um, I will not allow blood on the stage, but <laughs> on the screen, you may decide to do whatever you wish. But now I turn very quickly and swiftly to the discussion. And I would like to ask first, um, Mr. Lucio De Michele, um, if you would please uh, give us your comments and your uh, point of view. On you want me to, share, to stop sharing? Uh, yes, we... please stop sharing. Adi. Thank I will you. stop sharing, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm the head of the policy planning unit at the foreign ministry, um, Italian foreign ministry. Uh, I'm, so I'm, I'm bringing the perspective of the policy planning and not the policy making. So the meaning is that uh, what my views here are, are personal, not necessarily coinciding with the Italian government's view on these issues. Um, uh, the, the question is, what are the issues, actually? Uh, I'm, uh, um, so my, my first um, impression is that we need, we need some kind of a definition of, of focusing of the discussion, and, and then I would love... Uh, I will uh, bring my own perspective, which is uh, uh, the one of someone who's working on international affairs and trying to uh, understand what are the, the global trends and phenomena shaping the international affairs environment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so first, I, I, I completely um, share the view that um, uh, UMED is a, is a very uh, vague concept. Uh, I will... Uh, uh, I will consider this, um, I mean, there are at least four categories. One is the European Union member states, and I think this is a category of itself. You cannot, you cannot divide the, the European Union member states in, in this subject because there is a, a, a strong uh, regulatory power by the European Union uh, Commission that uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense uh, limits the liberty of individual member states or constraints at least. Uh, the policies. Uh, a second category, I think, the, let's say the Eastern Mediterranean countries. Then we have the North Africa and uh, and the Gulf, I'll say. Um, and the Eastern Mediterranean countries is also a very complex uh, landscape uh, because there are different different countries. And connectivity also connectivity also is is let's say an, an encompassing. Um, uh, world because uh, in connectivity, uh, to my understanding, um, only a fraction of connectivity is technology. Uh, all the discussions about the BRB Belt and Road Initiative uh, actually revolves around the infrastructure in general, and technology is only one part of that. Um, and security again is a, is a, is a cross cutting. Um, a concern because it concerns technology, but it's also, it also concerns, say, other infrastructural elements. Uh, look at the ports, for instance, all the discussion about uh, possible acquisition of ports by China in, in Europe. So all, all, these, um, all these things are, are, are bound together. And uh, the, the, the context we are, we are in is, is the context, as you mentioned rightly uh, beforehand, is the context of, a, let's say, a kind of a geopolitical competition between the, uh, the US and China. Uh, and I say the, the, this is a, a competition that um, uh, happens in, uh, let's say, in, in, in all these elements, connectivity, security, technology, um, which are in, in this sense, um, um, uh, can be reduced to to, to say to try to three uh, yeah, eyes. I think the one is the Im investment, infrastructure, innovation. These are the, these are the, the 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 things that bound I think bind together all these issues we are discussing about. 
so investment is basically the, the fuel, I mean, the resources, the money that you need uh, to build infrastructure, uh, which is the highway, I say, and, and to encourage innovation, which is the vehicle, I think. And so what you need to, to move, to back the vector to, you need to move, uh, and meaning that the more capable the, to innovate you are, the faster you can go. And, and against this, this, these elements, you can judge the relative, the relative position of, of uh, individual actors in this. And you find that probably um, in this kind of competition, um, and regardless of the region, because I, understand, I also share the view that probably there is not much uh, a specific issue related to UMED. Um, and then it, it is more about the global and systemic competition. This is this is a conceptual um, uh, environment we are we are in. So the European Union uh, or Mediterranean region is part of this landscape and probably not at this stage the central um, the, the, the center of gravity of all this. Uh, but in any case, what uh, we are living in uh, so the, the time we are living in. in uh, are, are structured about um, about this around around this competition, and one element is probably that the, this competition is more about economy than than about for instance military or security, and which is and this is also a defining um, element of this this uh, of this um, era we are living in. Um, what but I mean the, the sheer availability of resources is not the only element here; it's not sufficient. You need also the ability to invest, to invest strategically, and you also need uh, the ability to to implement uh, the strategies, the strategies, and turn strategy in policies. All this uh, point to the fact that China appears to be a, a very well placed actor in this competition, in this race, whereas, and that's <laughs> probably going. Uh, towards uh, the, the basic um, uh, elements of the presentation uh, before, whereas the, the European Union does not seem to be particularly well, well equipped in, in that. Um, recently, I think the European Union as such has tried to uh, elaborate some kind of uh, response strategy to, to, the, let's say, to the connectivity strategy um, uh, conducted by, by China, um it is defensive and it is uh, as i said um um limited by what european union can actually do on it in terms of policies uh because the i mean eu is basically a, a regulatory power it's a trade power um what you need here is exactly to build to invest directly in infrastructure and promote innovation in all these three elements the european union as, as such as very little resources. Um, and that's, um, let's say, um, that's a situation where um, we can see you is probably not the better equipped animal to survive in this, in this environment. Um, the big question mark here, as I see in this competition is, is, is the US. So how the US is going to, to do and pursue this, this, its own policies uh, because at, at times you see um, the U.S. seem to be reluctant in a way to engage in world affairs. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a strong sense of competition and rivalry to China, which in the end will, will probably force the U.S. To, to, to step in a bit more, including in the Euro-Mediterranean region. And I think this is going to shape um, the futures in the, in, the, in the year to come. Um, I was I will stop my my brief remarks here and uh, engage in conversation later on if there is the opportunity. So thank you. Thank you very very much, um, Mr. Hu Kun. Um, from the practitioner's uh, point of view uh, of uh, ZTE, etc. Please. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity to join this discussion. Uh, I believe, uh, from the company point of view, I uh, I, I, I would not to have a, like a strong debate today, but I do have some uh, point to be shared uh, with uh, all of you okay, based on the 
presentation made by Professor Aliyev. Uh, so first, I think it's a good thing, to, the attention and also the caution we have in keeping about the technology. Okay. Uh, also regarding the security concerning. But to over promotion is sometimes I feel we are facing this situation. The over promotion for me is a bit kind of a trafficking the anxious and also to mixing the technology matter and the political matter or geopolitical matter is making the things worse. This is the, the, the first starting point I would like to share. I, I do not really agree that uh, the safety of the technology is unmanageable, unfortunately, because uh, several other points regarding the different uh, government interests, uh, regarding the uh, also the, the different the technology policy okay, are based on this. Okay? If we think the security or technology are unmanageable, then as the consequence, of course, you can have a, a lot of completely different strategy. But my perception is that technology or even security is manageable. It's complex, of course, more and more complex. But we need to believe the power of technology itself. So it is manageable. We just need to keep caution. We continue to, how say, optimize the vulnerability of the system. We cannot just stay at home if we are afraid of the risk to be a, to, 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 to have accidents in the streets. So this is a, another point I would like to underline. And uh, another very specific point I, I would like to share is that we are generally talking about ICT sector. But I have to point out uh, inside ICT, okay, there's IT and CT. So city communication system, mainly related to us, is the telecommunication, which for me is, is a highway or is a road. A different IT applications or service based on these roads. That part, I agree. I don't have more deeper knowledge about the IT part. I, I agree that part is more complex. But to build the road is easier. It's an infrastructure. It doesn't matter who provided the stone who help you to build the street. Once the street is built, it's your street, it's your road. And also, it's important to underline, all this telecommunication system design is based on over past years, almost 100 years, global standards, which for 5G, for example, 3GPP are playing a very key essential role. So all the system design are based on this international standards. So the complexity is there, but it's not that complex that we are not able to manage. This is a, the first uh, chapter I want to share. And then I also would like to uh, share with you about my perception. You mentioned about the uh, technology uh, sovereignty. You're talking about the, the colony at the Europe could be in a in, in the middle between the US and China. Okay. So personally, I do not really appreciate uh, this kind of concepts. For me, it's, a, it's like, a, okay, we are trying to catch the eyes of the people. We are trying to over promote uh, the concern. Okay. Again, concern is good, okay, but it's too much. Okay. You mentioned about uh, Alibaba. You mentioned about uh, another uh, internet uh, gems in China, Tencent, for example. You said the data, they are very powerful, and we have a data in China. I want to just share two things okay, with you. Both Alibaba and Tencent, the biggest, the majority of the shareholder are international, not really Chinese. Okay. Secondly, why they put their data server in China? Simply because China is their main market today. If one day they found Europe, it's a bigger market. They simply move the server, move everything in Europe. So for me, it's, it's not a matter of uh, uh, technology uh, surveillance. It's a matter of uh, how to participate as a company, not as a country. The global uh, competition okay, in this point of view. So <clears throat> also, I, I believe uh, Europe is not really weaker. 
in terms of technology. Okay. I have been uh, in the euro for almost eight years. I never have this uh, perception that the euro in terms of technology is weaker than US or than China. Okay. Just to give you an example, in our sector related to telecommunication infrastructure. For now in Europe, okay, there are four big gems globally. Two of them are in Europe and they are able to provide all the parts needed for the telecommunication system. In my point of view, US, they are much stronger in terms of the, uh, like a basic technology research, okay, chipsets, also in terms of the marketing scale. And China are in the current time are more, uh, I'll say, relevant in terms of the service, let's say, application level. Also relevantly, the marketing, the market scale. And Europe is also able to manage both, but both of these parts, they are not the best, but they are able to manage. Okay. So I'm just using our sector as the example. So for me, Europe is not weaker or behind. It's a relevance, it's a, it's a result of the past decades of uh, global collaboration. Okay. And uh, I observed that some countries, for example, some governments, they choose due to the fairness of the, to lose or to be behind on the com techni technical competition, they choose to close the door okay, or to make some interruption. This definitely, frankly speaking, make me uh, thinking about uh, in the 19th, uh, 19th century, uh, the, the old China, okay, which in the late uh, Qing dynasty, when they are fear of this uh, Western country, okay, new technology, new culture, new way of life, they simply close the door and then everybody knows what happens after a few decades of years. So for me, the most important <clears throat> is to uh, believe the power of the technology itself to keep open. We see in the past uh, more than 40 years, due to this openness of China, how the economic growth happened in China. And also for me, the technology advantage or somehow not, not a comprehensive advantage, but in some sector is the natural consequence of the economic growth. It's like the people, when you become richer and richer, you have more time to think about, uh, maybe I can live in a better way okay? instead of just to to, to to have the food to feed. The country for me is the same. So it's not the, for me, it's not the, the matter of any country or any government intends to push okay, for the technology sector to be leading the world. It, it's, it's a kind of a, uh, promotion each other between the economic growth and also the technological growth or innovation, let's say. So uh, that's why I think uh, even under the current uh, geopolitical uh, environment, the uh, Chinese government is still underlying, uh, try to convey the message to the world that uh, we will be more open, keep, continue to open instead of cutting okay, the link with the, with the abroad. For me, this is the, 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 the rationale behind. So technology is never an issue. Okay? I think the key in any country is the development of the economy. That's the base of everything. So you mentioned also the, the cluster, the concept of cluster. Why the Chinese government is pushing the idea of the, uh, the cluster? For me, it's the same. The, re the reason is very simple, the collaboration. So in one cluster, you can find uh, in the ecosystem every single part easily. Then they support each other. They have this collaboration. Then everybody gets benefits. Okay, so before I finish, I would like to also uh, call, take this opportunity, uh, one, one matter okay, regarding the concerning of the, the, the security, okay, regarding the, the trust, let's say. Unfortunately, we are in the 21st century, but sometimes we have to still to live in the world, okay, including the business world, political world, okay, with uh, uh, speculations, with, with suspicious, with the, uh, uh, pre, uh, with the prejudice okay, sometimes. 
and sometimes when the media, okay, newspaper, they join this game, it makes the things even worse. So I, this is definitely not really useful and helpful for solving our challenge we are facing today in our world. So I would like to call also attention, everybody in this system to be more rational, think about the real things, and trying to focus on solving the issue itself. So that, that's all my point I would like to share in this phase. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hukun of ZTE. And now we move to Mr. Luigi De Vecchis, uh, of uh, the president of uh, Huawei, please. Hello, uh, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, this is a really tough discussion, <laughs> let's say, around confrontation and competition. I, let, let me say that I don't know the, the China country like, of course, uh, the person that I respect, Mr. Uku, knows. But uh, let me say that I'm an Italian working in this uh, big multinational company with uh, a lot of experience in the market because I used to be CEO of uh, Siemens Telecommunication in the past year, I was part of the government in the past government, so, and, and I was also in the telecommunication uh, telecom. I know this, this, this field that uh, Kuhn described it very well. Let, let me say that uh, I think that in the world, uh, specifically in the area of sometimes, uh, uh, let's say, non expert of technology, uh, the fact that uh, technology is not so well known like geopolitics, uh, this can be really a matter because most of the time we put together innovation technology with geopolitical matter and this creates a problem. Let's say that uh, we all agree that uh, the innovative technology which is flowing into the market, it is uh, really the ultimate chance and tool uh, that will help to build a more sustainable world. So this is what we see. We will uh, fight against uh, uh, disease with the, the technology. We'll fight uh, to support the nature uh, to reestablish re the resources. So I think that uh, we have to know that uh, all this kind of uh, innovation and uh, uh, let's say new technology comes because of global collaboration, the global supply chain. Every big company that belongs to that international bodies that uh, Mr. Kuhn described uh, works together to create uh, a safety and fast and useful uh, telecommunication worlds. And uh, each one of, of the actors, uh, they put together their own competence so that globally, in terms of uh, patents and that uh, everyone can deliver in the market, can cooperate together to have a better solution for the market. For instance, uh, just to let you know, if you build a technology which, for instance, uh, being fitted into the network will uh, use 30 or 40 percent less energy than the previous one, this is a big benefit for the, let's say, the, the natural, for the environment. So the global supply ch chain is very much important. Uh, and uh, let me say that, uh, since yesterday, before, of course, the fight between US and China, uh, we used to work very closely with uh, Google, uh, with uh, uh, Qualcomm, and uh, we put together the two competencies because uh, one way is competent to build uh, architectural system, while the other one were very much competent to build chipset, uh, as well as uh, uh, Google for uh, the Android system for the, the mobile phone. So both together, we arrived to have the best, let's say, solution for the world. Now, what's, what's going on is a mess for both the sides, <laughs> because every one of the two has to develop the competence that they exchanged since yesterday. And this will create problem or real competition and probably will put back into the geopolitical matter that we want to avoid. Uh, let me say also that uh, the telecommunication market uh, and the telecommunication uh, um, technology are the most, uh, let's say, secure and safety technology. This is because any piece of technology, any piece of software comes from this standardization body. Just to let you have the name uh, ITU, 3GPP, uh, and, and, and you know, all the others uh, uh, taking care of the new technology. 
If you get out of this world and you go into the normal cyberspace, there are no similar bodies. And I think a country has to be able to protect their own sensible infrastructure rather than to fight an industrial company cooperating at global level because of their nationalities. So this is from the technology point of view. Uh, let me finish uh, saying that uh, technology is, of course, uh, the prerequisite to develop, uh, to make the digital transformation of the economy that we all need to improve our our uh, our wellness, uh, our, uh, let's say, even uh, economy position, our social life, uh, and uh, all the things regarding the tool that will be used in order to make this transformation uh, available and ready for the citizen is something that uh, still needs to happen. And this is the chance, the chance for Europe. I think that Europe has to find a balance between the true alliances with the uh, United States, because uh, it's a very old alliances, but they have to have a look into other possi possible partners where the market is still growing and where there is uh, a lot of uh, chance for all of us. I never had in my you know, five year of uh, Huawei any kind of constraint to do things that uh, could make problem or may damage the image of this Chinese company. We are a multinational company like many others in the world. And I believe that today the political decision maker, they have to deal in order to protect the country and not to avoid this kind of geopolitical war. Thank you very much, President Devekis. Um, I think you bring uh, to the fore one of the major questions that we have in uh, one of the fields that I'm working on, which is history of science and technology, which is uh, do science and technology have a national identity? When you're talking about a company like Huawei or like ZTE that have prominent uh, research center and development centers here in Israel, uh, where does the national uh, identity of the company begins or ends? That's a, a, a big question, but unfortunately, I don't have the time to expand on that. I'd be happy to another occasion because right now we are moving to Ilan Mao. Ilan, thank you very much for joining us. And again, our focus, we try to bring it to our region, to the MED, to the uh, Euromed. Thank you very much, Ilan. The floor is yours. Sure. Well, I've been practicing uh, China for the last, I think, 25 years, uh, half of which on the Israeli foreign ministry in the, the second half in business, so I'll try to combine both. Uh, the question that we were asked is, is there a China, uh, uh, UMED uh, China issue? Yes, there is no China Euromed issue. There is a China UMED US issue. Because if you take the, the American factor out, there is no really, really issue. Israel will manage well the relationship with China on technology and so on, and so does the Europeans. The, it changes when our good ally, and it's a good ally of Israel and Europe, is stepping in. And the reason is because China is much more than technology, much more than business for the American strategy. It is strategy, it is defense, it is business, it's internal politics, it's external politics. It's a major issue for the US. And unfortunately for us, for everybody involved in this conversation today, the US have made it into our problem. And it's been like that for the last 25 years. You know, I, I went to China in 2001 as a consul general. And the first thing I had in, on my table was the Falcon issue. I'm sorry, the, the Falcon issue. Then in 2005, just before I left, it was the Harvey issue. And we thought after a few years that this issue is off the table and we find out this is definitely not happening. Now, the American for various reasons wants to limit the development of China as a superpower. And I can understand that. But the problem is that especially in the last five to six years, they have been doing it 
not only dealing with military issues, strategy and so on, but also using technology as a weapon and trying to limit the cooperation between other countries and China on technology. And this is something that is not only harmful for, in my view, for China-US relation, but it is harmful for the relationship between China and the rest of the world and, and Israel and Europe is included. And this is a real thing, you know, it's not a theory. It's not just statements, it's in actual life. In Israel, there is a big pressure from the US to start something like CFUs that would limit the cooperation between Israel and China on technology and so on. And I, I follow what's happening in Europe and I've been in a few symposiums like this and I've seen it happening in Europe as well. And I think maybe the best example is ASML, the leading semiconductor company from the Netherlands that was blocked from selling solutions to China. Now, I could even understand that if we were talking about trying to avoid military technology, that's understandable. Even dual use technology, I can even understand that, but it goes way beyond that. It is basically almost every aspect of technology becomes now a problem. And this is something that is going to make a big problem between Israel, Europe, the U and China. And this is something, and now, you know, I'm enjoying the fact that I'm not in government anymore, but I'm in the business. And this is something that we should not accept. And this is something that the business sectors and the politics and the governments have to come and say, yes, the US is an ally of European countries, is an ally of Israel. He's a major ally of Israel. Our relationship with, with the US is critical for our strategy and our future, but we have to put a limit. And we have to remind our American friends that it is okay to hold the big stick if you want to avoid problem, but once you use it and you use it more than once, it becomes less effective. And I think this is where we stand after four years of the last regime in the US. And unfortunately, I was hoping to see a significant change in the, the situation after Biden was elected. We don't see it yet. I still am hopeful, but if we want to avoid losing and losing in many ways on business, on strategy, on financial technology, then we have to find a way to balance between the actual and real concerns of our American allies and our national interest. And cooperation with China is in our national interest. And we have to find a balance between those two. And I think this is right for Israel. And it is right for almost every country in Europe because both China and US are important for the future development of our region. Um, I'll stop here because I want to keep the time and to leave some time for questions. I'll be happy to extend more if you want later on. Thank you very much, Ilan. Now we move to our two uh, last discussions uh, from academia, after we had three from the real world. Um, Francesco Lapenta, we're going to listen to you right now. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you uh, to Enrico, Professor Enrico Fardella for organizing this uh, series of events. Uh, I've been following them carefully and I find them really fascinating. And, uh, and I find equally fascinating to have a question that I have to try to give an answer to. So he posed a very complicated question, right? What is the new role of technology in the china euro med relations? And uh, there's been a great analysis of uh, uh, some of the key uh, dimensions of this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, nuanced picture of the relations and the uh, uh, confrontations that might be uh, between uh, the technological model of China and the US. I want, if, if I manage in, uh, in five minutes, to give uh, what I call a, a, a bit of an eagle's eye uh, view on this, uh, relating a little bit to the history of science and technology that you were mentioning, uh, Ori. First of all, when I hear uh, talking about technology, uh, I'm always mystified by the fact that uh, people uh, kind of think of technology as something that has a, a life of its own. Uh, now, I think to put context to this, and now it's, in, uh, it's the product of human endeavors, but very much of values and political and power relations and ideological relations, I want you to put it in context. First of all, we need to be aware that we are uh, uh, literally 0.01% of life on Earth, humans. 
we are 2.5% of the animal mass of the planet. Technology has become uh, the uh, tool uh, to empower and to dominate and govern nature and altering the natural relation that exists on the planet uh, for life, for example. So we have seen, and there's a very vibrant and important discussion today about the role of technology in changing uh, our planet. What is interesting if you have this different perception of technology is that you understand that despite the political, cultural identity differences that might be, uh, there is a common problem, right? The pandemic has proved us that we share uh, one single environment. Now, so you have this, uh, you have a single environment that presents the same uh, problems and that presents the same uh, challenges and technology can be conceived as possibly one tool to solve what are generally shared challenges. So I don't see Chinese, I don't see Europeans, I don't see Americans, I see fundamentally humans. And when we talk about risks, I have a much more broad understanding of where risks uh, really are. Uh, let me give you an, uh, a little example. We only be stuck in what is a form of uh, uh, unconscious conditions where you're processing uh, technology and the relations between geopolitics and technological evolution, right? Let me give you a basic example. If I ask you why we live uh, in a world where uh, the day is divided into 24 hours, uh, none of you will be able to answer. It's a standard that was created some time ago and we have internalized it. We actually don't even know who decided it. Why they're 24? Why they're not 50? Why don't we use a different standard? So the issue of standards is important. Now, what I'm, I'm really wondering is, um, I question what uh, world would we live in today if technology wasn't developed as a consequence of the first and second world war? I think the first and the second world war had a fundamental dimension, had the fundamental effect on the way in which technological innovation is conceived. Uh, so during and after the two uh, world wars, what became clear is that those who controlled the future path of technological innovation military and not, uh, would dominate fundamental dimensions of geopolitical power relations. So the heritage of our history and technology, contemporary technology, to this day is the very conception of technological innovation as a form of a permanent competition, military or otherwise industrial, economic, political, in which technological leadership and technological innovation itself uh, are not seen necessarily as a collective action or shared path towards the betterment of humanity and the human condition, but as a permanent confrontation of ideologies, values, social, economic system in constant competition and conflict. And that's what I've seen uh, the discussion uh, to be leading uh, today, mostly on the confrontation of this path. Now, I actually do see uh, uh, something uh, that is happening that is kind of interesting. Um, Europe has been positioned as the weakest element in this new uh, kind of path of evolution. Uh, we're going to face uh, uh, climate change, we're going to face the evolution of uh, uh, new models and new technologies for the energy sector. Uh, we're going to face enormous challenges in uh, dominating and controlling uh, the development of artificial intelligence. Now, what I find interesting is that if you look at the different layers of risks, some of these risks can be characterized as uh, pertaining to these uh, geopolitical relations. And I don't think we can get rid of the competition between China, Europe, and the States in dominating this uh, uh, path to establish standards in technology, because we have seen that historically we have been coded to understand that being able to control these standards uh, we agree, will give great economic and social and political and military advantages. So I'm a realist and I think that it's not uh, possible to change that. What I, I really uh, would like to discuss and push forward is uh, uh, this kind of uh, onion kind of layers. Uh, basically, what I suggest is a different understanding of risks that looks at technology as uh, something that can have points of contact between uh, the US and Europe and China and Europe could work theoretically as the soft power that puts these two ideologies in contact. If we start to think, for example, about the idea of what I call uh, a scientific diplomacy, areas of engagement that can be 
dictated, for example, by the 2030 Agenda for Sustain Sustainable Development of the United Nations, common goals that are shared by many nations, common problems that can become not only part of that competition, but can be become part of a co-production. So what I'm saying is, on one side, we can look at all the, the elements that have been discussed, but what I wish that we would discuss also is the common challenges that possibly Europe and China and the states could be facing together, and what are the strategies that we could, we could enact to overcome the only economic and political and military uh, artificial competition that's been created by the model of the two wars. I think we have to move in the 21st century and understand that we share one planet and a set of problems, and we can set aside the differences and perhaps fight over those, but try to address what we share. Thank you very, very much, Francesco, for this important intervention. Um, we stay within academia, and this time with the University of Florence, uh, Luigi Martino, please. Thank you very much. And let me to thank, first of all, my former professor, Rico Fardella, who, is my, who was my former professor at the University of Florence. I'm glad to be here. Uh, and I try to stay in five minutes. And uh, because I have a lot of questions, but I, unfortunately, I have few uh, uh, answers to my questions. First of all, I would like to point to focalize or to stress one point, because when we talk about technology, in my opinion, we have a specific political issue because technology in general is a neutral. The problem is how, to use, how you use the technology. This is a problem. And then we have a political issue. At the same time, I totally agree that with the, my previous, the previous speaker, speakers, when they stressed the weakness of the European Union in this sector, I totally agree. But my question is why we are not able to start from an Israeli point of view, for instance, because maybe we can use the best practice of Israel in this field and to start from a weakness point and then to, to use this weakness as an opportunity, maybe. Because here the problem is that it, it, I totally agree because we lost our opportunity to create a technological actor at the European Union, but we have the opportunity maybe to create an alternative way. Then here the problem is that when we talk about our alliances, the problem is our value. And then there's another problem, another political problem. What about cultural or political values. What about the balance between security and privacy? But are you sure that when we talk about security, it's a just a state concerns? Or maybe we, when we talk about technology, in particular cyber, we are talking about state security, nation, national security, and also citizen security and economic security, maybe. And then are you sure that when we talk about privacy, is it just an individual concern? No, because at the European Union, for us, privacy is a human right. And also at the Italian level, for instance, the Article 13, privacy is a human right for us at the European Union. And then this is a problem, maybe. but another problem from a technology point of view is the accountability. And then who is in charge? Who is responsible maybe for the malicious use, usage of ICTs, et cetera. Then I will I finish now, but just I would like to share with you this question, but in, in your opinion, is the presence of a private Chinese actors a real problem for the EU security or EU meant security? No, in my opinion. It's not a problem because we are lucky because we are open. We are an open market. 
is the presence and the prominence of the Chinese government in this private actor a problem? Maybe. I don't have any answer. But is this a problem? Yes. What about other foreign actors? Maybe that receive the sensibility or the prominence of, from the government. Is this a cultural and political confrontation when we talk about technology? Yes, in my opinion. And then we need to find the appropriate balance between public and private interests, maybe, but also national security and the economic interests, and a perfect balance between security and privacy. And then uh, I, as I said before, when I start my intervention, then let me thank you again for this invitation. I have very, very several questions, and then I look forward to receive some answer from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Martino. I think that uh, from the perspectives of uh, uh, all the speakers here, it's apparent that uh, the questions that were raised in the beginning of our panel, and certainly uh, also before it are uh, uh, certainly important questions that deserve further discussion and I do hope that uh, soon enough we will all have the opportunity to meet together physically and not only via technology and uh, discuss those issues in depth uh, together. Thank you very much and I uh, close this uh, session. <laughs>